from a department's point of view, um, I think we actually moved quite a long way. So getting agreement to the principles of Dilmot, I think, is a significant um, achievement, actually. It is important to kind of bank those principles. I think what would be unhelpful is if we started then having a discussion about, well, perhaps you know, a cap isn't the right thing, or um, you know, do we really need an extension of the means test, or um, contribution to general living costs? First of all, care is not discretionary. So you know, if you wake up in bed one morning having had a stroke and you can't help yourself, your care needs start that morning. So it's no point in saying, well, we'll plan delivery of care. Care needs to be delivered when it needs to be delivered. And what happens, what we see happening all the time is people not getting the care they need to keep them, A, to give them the best possible quality of life, which we'd all like to see, but also to keep them safe and well. Andrew Lansley yesterday at one of the select committees was being harangued about the disappointment that many in the sector felt about the financing and funding question being postponed to the comprehensive spending review. His response, in quite an ill-tempered way, was to say, well, charities and pressure groups always want more. Well, yeah, we do. <laughs> and we do for some very obvious reasons. One is 15-minute appointments are unacceptable. Sending people into hospital when they don't need to be in hospital because they don't have the care that they need is unacceptable. Giving people uh, a shower once a week because the local authority can't afford to provide more is unacceptable. So yet we are really, really disappointed. There are some things um, in the package that we like, um, particularly the sort of information and advice. Um, we think we, we can do a lot with that and specifically we, th we believe that needs to include access to financial advice as well. People are potentially um, purchasing one of the most expensive things of their life and, and they need help and financial advice in, in arranging that and it, it's in the interests of everyone that they don't run out of money because if they do then they could fall back on local authorities which is hopeless. Um, that said uh, we are overall of course very very disappointed because um, we wanted to see a very clear intent and a road to, to the funding whereas actually what we see is that this has been put in the pending tray. I think we all know the spending review is going to be a very tough one. Um, it's not easy to, we, we need some way of raising the money for this. It's not easy to raise taxes with a squeeze on household incomes. So we are going to have to make a strong case in the spending review. And I think the evidence that we will be you know, gathering over the next few months through the engagement will be really, really helpful. There is a serious underfunding of social care now. Uh, councils are cutting back on the provision that they're providing. The provision of care is more restricted than ever. Many people are missing out and are outside the state system. The pressure on carers is growing. Additional money from the NHS hasn't filled the gap, nor has the 7.2 billion that the government talk about, particularly in the context of the 26% cuts for local authorities. So the situation about the financing and funding of social care in the context of increased demographic pressures is absolutely huge. It's a burning, burning platform for us. It paralyses the individuals in their ability to plan because they don't know what they're planning for because there's a, you know, would you take out some insurance for this? Well, I don't know. I might not need it because somebody else might come and pay for it for me. And so, so people are paralysed. Financial advisors are paralysed because they don't know what financial advice to give people. How can they in advance? Um, and the, the financial services industry, the insurance companies, are paralysed because they don't know what they're designing a product for. We, we have in place a safety net. And the safety net is the NHS. So that if you actually give somebody who's frail inadequate care, eventually they fall over and they end up in hospital. And we then deliver very expensive care in a very expensive setting in a system which isn't set up to properly assess and plan and deliver the needs for people. I think the progress report does set out, I mean, I don't know how many people have read it, but there is actually, we have actually included quite a lot more analysis in there from what was included in the, in the Dilnock Commission's report. You know, we've taken the costings a lot further, we've thought about implementation methods, so there is a lot more in there, including um, costs for different levels of the cap. Mm. I think what would be helpful is for the sector to be able to provide us with information which really does help us say, look, this really, really will help people. You know, there's lots of, I think there's lots of plausible explanation there how it will help people. 
Um, okay. We believe it, but I think there is something about, can we really marshal the evidence? I think I take from it, though, the glass is half full rather than half empty. And I do believe strongly that the Department of Health and, and, and many very professional colleagues there worked extremely hard to get an in-principle agreement to the DILNOT proposals. And that's something we should uh, warmly welcome and hold the government to account for it. We, we must keep the pressure on politically to ensure that this doesn't go off the agenda. It occurs to us that the next spending review is likely to be quite close to the next general election. And what that means is we all need to, as a sector, get together and make sure that each political party independently has this in its manifesto, which they'll be drawing up potentially before the, the, the next spending review, to have that pledge and commitment to sort this out once and for all and not just keep it in the pending tray forever and ever and ever. We cannot assume... Uh, that the case for change has always been made because there will always be a demand from, particularly from some quarters of government, for more and more evidence. So um, I think the sooner we're clearer about what would be helpful, Charles, the better, whether that's yep. figures, whether it's stories, whatever. Um, and the third point is a question about momentum. How do we keep this going? And there's a paradox here, isn't there? Because if social care were a bank or a can of petrol or a high-speed rail link, or a wheelie bin. Or a wheelie bin. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conference. And yet, if you look at the figures, um, I reckon if you add up people who use care and support, people who deliver it, uh, carers especially, you're getting on for about 10 million people, which is a quarter of the adult population. Uh, and this ought to be uh, making a lot more noise on the political radar uh, than it should be. We as a sector have to make again the moral and social argument about the need for change and the need for reform and the way in which we need to do that has to improve it needs to move beyond a policy argument into a very hard-hitting public articulation of what the impact is on individuals